called double jacking, and that takes two miners. That's what's going on over here. The miner sitting down is holding the bull still in his shoulders. He's called the shaker. The guy behind him with the hammer is a striker. So every time that striker hits that bull steel, the shaker has to turn it a quarter boy. To make things worse for those miners, in a normal functioning mine, they'll never hang up lights like you see above us. In those days, miners were given two candles per show. So as you can see, there's not a lot of light, not a lot of room, but a lot of trust that you might have to put in a complete stranger behind you. You might be wondering what happens if you were to hit your partner. Well, they do switch off periodically. <laughs> so if you're not careful, as soon as he wakes up, your turn was coming. <laughs> but after, oh, after those candles, they start using carbide lamps. And all this is a two-compartment lamp that has calcium carbide at the bottom. If you've never seen that before, that looks a lot like cat litter. And then on the top, it'll be water. And as that water drips out into that calcium carbide, it would mix together. And it creates acetylene gas. It leaks out right in the middle where you could light that flame. And that acetylene flame would look something just like this. Now, if you take a look at this miner over here, kind of sticks out like a sore thumb, he's in the street clothes. And that's a sign of a tenderfoot, or inexperienced miner. Now, in those days, tenderfoots used to wear carbide lamps in their hard hats, just like you'll see over here. And the problem with that is if you were sitting in front of that striker, every time he swings that hammer, he's creating a gust of wind that will carry this flame down to a miner's face and burn off any eyebrows or facial hair that a miner might have, <laughs> just like this fellow over here managed to do as well. <laughs> but nowadays, we use rechargeable battery packs that are good for anywhere up to 48 hours. They just clip on your belt and they're attached to LED light bulbs. My bulb has two settings, and the first one is pretty dim, but I have a brighter setting as well. So if we were down here in an active mining operation, this is all the light that each one of us would have to work with. Now as we walk down to the next part, <laughs> now the purpose of drilling holes into those walls is so you can fill them up with dynamite and blast. And we'll talk about that dynamite in just a few minutes. But once you get done blasting, you have all that loose rock on the ground that the miners called muck, and that's spelled M-U-K. That miner back there is a hand mucker, and it's his job to shove up all that loose rock, fill up this one ton ore cart, one and a half times to two times an hour. If he can't meet that quota, he was fired, just like that. If you guys are familiar with a gentleman by the name of Jim, and he did work in quite a few of these mines as one of those hand muckers, but he never had the stamina to keep up with those miners, and eventually lost all of his jobs in the mining industry. <laughs> Not long after that, Jack Dempsey gave boxing a try and later became the world heavyweight boxing champion. So if that gives you an idea as to how hard these miners really had to work down here, any miner with their feet in the ground, just like that guy, in 1891, their highest paid wage was $2 a day. Now you guys can all get as close to as change as you want or cart in as little as 10 minutes. I will be operating quite a bit of equipment for you guys down here, and it can be pretty noisy. So before I turn anything on, I'll always give you a heads up. So if you want to cover your ears, you guys are more than welcome to do so. So if they're not careful with these machines, they bring that bucket up too fast, they can seriously injure it or even kill that miner. When we got off the cages, I know we were kind of rushed out of an area, but you might have seen a sign that said the Gold King Crosscut. If you take a look to your right, you'll see another sign that also says a Gold King Crosscut. Now, <clears throat> these are... Don't run, but walk swiftly. you see around us is magnesium sulfate, or better known as Epsom salt, and it does naturally leach out of the walls around us down here. There's just not enough of it down here, and it was never valuable enough, so the miners had to sit down here. You can use this salt in your bath. It makes your skin softer. 
However, it is also a natural laxative, so we don't suggest you put this in your mouth right down here. <laughs> You'd be surprised how often that can happen. We used to give it to cows. What's that? We used to feed it to cows uh, when they were bloated. Oh, okay. Yeah, see, I learn something about it new almost every yeah. day. <laughs> it's diluted with water, but of course. <laughs> no, mineral oil, mineral yeah. oil. Mm -hmm. we'll okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> At the turn of the 19th century, they created the piston drill, and this drill weighs 200 pounds, takes two miners to operate, and they're using three different sizes of drill still. So they're going to start with a two foot, work up to a four foot, and they finish with a six foot drill still. Once you got done drilling that six foot hole, you and that other miner would have to move this drill up or down in this column right here, or left or right on this column right here, wherever your next hole is going to be drilled. Now, originally, this was powered by steam-powered air, but for our sake, everything that I operate for you down here has either been converted to or runs on compressed air. So if you want to cover your ears, you guys are more than welcome to do so. Cover your ears, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Put my hearing aid back in. <laughs> <laughs> now, back then, miners didn't have any form of hearing protection, but they were down here constantly smoking cigarettes, which wasn't very smart on their part. But when the cigarette companies came out with filtered cigarettes, those butts on the end, the miners quickly realized that you could break those butts off and put them in your ears. That's the very first form of hearing protection used down here in the mines. <laughs> but right here in front of you is a stick of black powder dynamite, and those will freeze anywhere below 55 degrees. Down here on this level, it is 50 degrees year-round, no matter what the temperature is on the surface. It's also the warmest level that we have here at the Mullen. So we have to have stick warmers, just like you'll see next to me, and they would have one of these on every working level of the mine. So for us, there'd be five stick warmers down here. When they're ready to blast, they'll bring those sticks of dynamite over here, and they'll start to fill these holes up as fast as they can, so that each one of those holes would look something just like this. Then they're going to tie their fuses together down there in the middle so you would have one long fuse that you could light and run to about where the mine shaft is from where we're standing right now and they have to count these shots as they're going off. If for some reason they think some of these shots didn't go off or they're frozen, that new guy, the tenderfoot without the eyebrows, is getting a miner's spoon. And it's his job to come back here and very carefully try and fish out any sticks of dynamite that still might be stuck in the holes around us. Any questions so far? No, we're going to collapse. <laughs> All right, now, in 1940, they created the Gardner Denver 83, but we like to call this the Jack Lake Drill because this thing will do most of the work for us. Weighs about 85 pounds, takes one minute to operate, and the only yeah. way, I only use one size drill still, just like you see to my right. But the problem with this giant drill still is it does tend to get stuck in the walls pretty easily. And when this happens, it's called a hung steel. Four years ago, we got one stuck ourselves, and I've been pulling on it ever since. It's not budged. <laughs> the reason why that hung steel is so dangerous is once that steel gets stuck in the wall like that, this leg right here will start spinning. You can seriously engine the miner that way. Unfortunately, this drill is out of commission right now, so I'm not able to operate it for you guys. But when the 50s rolled around, they changed the form of dynamite to wet gel dynamite. So they'll take this bigger primer stick, cut it into thirds, just like you see below it, and they'll put one of those sticks into each one of these holes. And they seal it up with prow beads or ammonium nitrate, just like you'll see in this jar down here. Now you might be disappointed to hear that I don't have any explosives to demonstrate for you down here in the line. <laughs> but I do have a recording for you guys to listen to, and it won't be very loud. But it does give you an idea of what these blasting patterns will sound like to the miners when they're down here. We'll listen to this as we walk down the next part of this drift as well.
I like her facial expressions. She's so <laughs> animated. <laughs> no. She's excited. <laughs> All right, now, if you guys have seen the gold mining shows where they're looking for nuggets of gold, we don't have that up here in Cripple Creek Victor. Most of the gold we find in this 24 square mile radius around us are nothing more than microscopic flecks. So if you want to come up here, take a closer look at more, they're welcome to. But right here, right where my lights at are very, very small specks of gold just shining right off the top of that rock. Can you see it? That's the gold we're looking for. Very, very small. <laughs> for our purple veins that we call fluorite, just like you see in front of us. And these fluorite veins will vary from several inches wide to several feet wide. They run horizontally and they run vertically as well. Just because we're looking for these veins, it's not a guarantee that gold is nearby. It's a good indication. So to find out if that area is worth mining, they're going to break off a chunk of this host rock put it into a canvas bag, and it gets sent to an assayer. It starts off by using a cyanide treatment to eat away a portion of this host rock. Whatever's left gets heated up to 1,400 degrees, and it's going to come bubbling up out of these samples. So if your samples had big bubbles or water bubbles, this is an area that you want to mine out. Very little bubbles means you could follow this vein, or you might have to try and find a whole new vein in hopes of finding a bigger, better patch of concentrated ore. That's what actually happened with this rock right here, which was pulled from directly above us. And above us is assayed at no more than half an ounce of gold per ton. Even in today's gold prices, that's just not worth mining. But you guys can all squeeze in here, because we'll take a look up for just a minute. Now, right here on the light side, there's another one of these fluoride veins running up and down. When the mining companies kept seeing the veins running like this, they realized if you're not already below it, it'll be a lot easier to drill down next to it, come up below that vein, and let gravity do most of the work for you. And this is a method that was called stope drilling, which is spelled S-T-O-P-E. What we're standing at is just the beginning of a stope, but if you see that flat board up there, that's called a drilling platform. And we'll stand up there with the stope drill and hammer into the rock directly above us, just like you'll see in this picture to your left. Now we are going to see this drill in person in just a few minutes, but as we're hammering into the rock directly above us, that would first knock the rocks around us loose. They'll come down around those platforms, land on the level below where they have slusher buckets waiting for them. And using those slusher buckets, you can push all of that fallen rock down to this ore chute where it's going to automatically load up in an ore cart. So when we have a fully formed stoke drilling operation, just like you see over here, no one's using explosives, and no miner would touch that rock with their hands until it makes it above ground to the surface. Oops, sorry. Now, there's drift, we're walking past the display, and there's just not a lot of room to talk about it all there. It didn't use it very long either, but it is called the Air Donkey, with a Terry Holder Tram. It was created by Molly Calfrey and Son after an article about the old homestead mine in South Dakota about the equipment they were using. He thought how hard it was going to be. He created his own version of this equipment, and by June of 1920, he succeeded creating his version of the Air Donkey. Now it is very small, it's not very effective, but I want to let you know what you're about to see. So as we walk by, you do want to take a picture or video, you are more than welcome to do so. <laughs> Coming up to your right is that air donkey, or the Perry Gordon tram that I was just talking about. A light bulb? Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we're wearing hard hats. <laughs> now, I will be getting out of your way in just a few minutes, so you'll all have a chance to take a look at everything behind me as well. But a couple years after they created the Air Donkey, they heard a mine supervisor by the name of Shirley Johnson who saw that machine and decided to improve upon it. And about a year after Shirley Johnson was hired, he rolled out with his version of the air locomotive. The only difference between these two machines with the size sticks attached to them, that one was steam powered. This one started using compressed air. 
Below both these tanks is a Baker steamer, and that would move the wheels. Behind these tanks are supposed to be seats, levers, and nozzles, so you can sit down and control the speed and the direction which you're going. Now, just like the Epsom salt, there are other minerals down here, not with mining. Right next to you guys, the green on the wall is oxidized copper. The yellow you're starting to see around us is sulfur, and right behind you guys, those dark patches halfway down the wall are oxidized iron. There's just not enough of these minerals down here with mining, so the miners have to sit down here. But if you go to places like Cave of the Winds, they'll talk to you about stalactites and stalagmites that can take thousands of years to form. Because of all the excess minerals and moisture that we have sitting above us, some of these can grow to this size in as little as seven months. They just get broken off for various reasons all the time. But once a stalactite and a stalagmite come together and connect, they create a column. And as I said, this can take thousands of years. So I'll get out of your way and you can get as close to this chain as you want. But behind that order, it's because the price of gold sank so low, the smelting mill in the district could no longer turn the profit. When they shut down, that forced most of the mines in the area to close down along with it. But this mine and another mine in the district known as the Ajax, once our smelting mills closed down, they tried to remain in operation by sending their gold to Leadville, Colorado. After a couple months, it was too costly, so we shut okay, down along with the truck, or CCNB. On a slow day, they're still pulling up more than a million dollars worth of gold, so they are doing better. Now what I have in my hands is one of the very first models of a stoke drill that the miners called the wiggle tail stoke drill. And they would spend their entire shift on a drilling platform, just like you see below me, and they'll wiggle this drill back and forth so that this piece of steel would not get stuck in the rocks above. But when we're down here working in a hard rock mining operation, we're creating fine rock particles in the dust all around us. Using this drill, that dust is coming down directly on top of the miner, and they're going to breathe most of that dust in. No matter where you're at in the mine or what you're doing, once you breathe in enough of that dust, you've contracted silicosis of the lungs. And back then, any miner to be diagnosed with silicosis was considered lucky to even survive past the age of 50. So they created jack tanks and they filled them full of water. Then they took these drill stills and they would drill holes right in the middle of them so as you're working, you can shoot water through this drill still. It turns a lot of that dust in the mud and it would lower your chances of contracting that silicosis. They also found out it keeps us a tad bit cooler so it didn't have to be repaired and replaced as often. But over here to my right is a working model of the stoke drill, just like you saw in that picture. It is hooked up to a jack tank, even though there's no water in it, and it rotates once in a while. All the drills that they operate for you guys down here never actually make contact with the rock around us, so you don't have to worry about that silicosis. However, this is the loudest display that we have down here, so I strongly encourage you to come to your ears. Now the next display I'll show you guys is a fully formed stove. And before I talk more about it, on the left side of this wall is a photo of it as it was being formed in the early 1900s when they were still using candles and hand tools. Once you've had a chance to take a look at this picture, line up on the right side of the wall, as close to this red machine as you guys can get. We'll take a little bit of them. Um, Go ahead and line up on the other side of the wall. Oh. Yeah, if you guys in the back want to squeeze in, we'll take a look right about us. Oh, no. Now this is a queen best stove, and it is the largest stove on display in North America. It goes up 740 feet. Now on the left side of that stove, you can see a miner sitting up there, and that's the highest paid miner back then. He got paid four dollars a day to be up there. That's that? That's 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 so yeah, to put that today's wages, the highest paid miner that I know that works at the strip mine behind us, he gets paid about forty-two dollars an hour just to drive a dump truck around, but he's been doing it for several, several years, a couple decades at least. Now at the beginning of the shift, he'd climb a ladder, take his tools and once on the bucket, he's not allowed to come down until the end of the shift. So chances are you got a relative work down here, anywhere between the ages of eight and thirteen. 
Those children were paid 50 cents a day to the army. Anything after 13, they're full blown minor, so they get paid $2 a day to the army. But if he needs a piece of equipment, he'll haul down one of those children who attached to this air tugger. And using this air tugger, you can take that equipment up to the miner, bring anything that's broken or damaged right back down to the boat. This won't be very loud, but if you do want to cover your ears, you're still more than welcome to. Now I do think this is pretty cool, so I could point this out just in case you haven't seen it yet. But over here to my right is an oxidized copper stalactite. You'll also see more oxidized copper running directly above you from a couple more weirdly shaped stalactites there as well. Once you've had a chance to take a look at everything that you want to see, go ahead and take a seat because we're going for a ride now. It is loud, it's next to the tank, so we're going to have those two girls sit all the way up front, it's going to be quiet. Yes. Whenever you're ready, just go ahead and take a seat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, all the way in the front. Let the camera go first. I see a black and white bar. You do. And they saw Shirley Johnson making these mantras. When they realized the idea was not protected, they stole that idea and patented it for themselves before he even knew what was going on. So this is the last man trip that Shirley Johnson ever made, and it did spend many years in the surface just collecting dust. But when we brought it down here and added it to the tour, we took off the original seats, and those were flat wooden boards. So back then, miners didn't even have back support like you're using right now. When miners were using candles and lamps, they did not light them until they got to where they're working. Most of this ride has been left dark on purpose to give you an idea of what that feels like to the miners well. It won't be very fast, but I must remind you, please remain seated. Keep your hands and feet inside the car at all times. At times during the ride, these walls will get narrow, so please be careful. Cross-cuts and twists of meat, which made them ideal locations for tool benches for repairs, just like you'll see in front of us. So anytime the wheels are broken or damaged piece of equipment, it's not gonna leave the mine. We come to one of these junctions. until another group comes along to fill back up. We closed out in 1961 as far as an active mining operation went. In 1963, a man by the name of Nick Cox bought this establishment to give tours through it, and the original tour route started on the level above us at 700 feet. You'd walk around in a circle up there. Then they got back in those cages and they came down here to the thousand foot level and you'd start the tour just like we did, but you'd walk in a much smaller circle than where we're walking right now. 
The original tour route, if you guys remember the Julian Davis drift, we took a right and saw those drills. The original tour route would go around the ore cart that was blocking off another part of that drift, and they'll come out this part of the Julian Davis drift. They'll take a left at this junction. At the next set of lights down there, they would take another left. It's a much smaller circle than what we're walking right now. But after a couple years, he thought, let's bring everything down to one level, make it one giant circle. So he started drilling blast down this drift behind you. When this was an active mining operation, miners were walking down this crosscut past the wall that sat there for many years, and not one miner thought to check 10 feet behind that wall. So imagine the look on Nick's face when in that first blast, he found a gold vein hiding right above his head. <laughs> now even though he pulled most of the gold out of this vein, he could not turn this into any money because he was not a legal mining operation. He did manage to smelt all this gold down into bars and coins, and they put that on display on the other side of the ore cart until 2009, when the price of gold was at previous all-time high. At that point, our owners were curious, and they wanted to know how much gold was really sitting in that case. Turns out that they had uh, a little bit more than over $1.5 million worth of gold just sitting there. So for safekeeping, it was quickly moved to storage, when no one has been allowed to see it. <laughs> now, you guys were actually fortunate enough to be up there. Some of you might have seen that fancy Corvette. That was the owner, so you, could, you guys can imagine where that gold went to. <laughs> but we do close for the winter. The reason why we close is when the temperature drops and it storms and snows, the barometric pressure drops along with it. And when the barometric pressure drops low enough, carbon dioxide or dead air will seep up from the bottom of the earth. This can happen all year round, but it happens a lot more during the winter. And when this happens, it's just not safe enough for us to bring anyone down here. So when we close for the winter season, the strip mine behind us is given free reign to blast whenever and however they want. So the first thing that we do before we open up in the spring is check all of our walls, make sure they're stable. A couple years ago, though, this wall had been knocked loose. We had to take a piece of it out, and we found more gold just sitting over here as well. So you guys can all come over here, take a close look if you want. And you'll just see it shining with all that silver. Wow. Once you've had a chance to take a look at this gold, we'll just go ahead and move to the next area behind me, and I'll meet you there. Can you girls see it? Yeah, since Stripmine has her way, they'll buy up the entire town. That's rats. And while that sounds like good, there's been a couple times where, you know, every couple months I'll get, you know, like an eight, ten thousand dollar check. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. The first is what we talked about is actually right behind you two. This blue one labeled the Gold King Mine. If you remember the crosscut that I pointed out at the very beginning of the tour, the Gold King crosscut leads into this mine. And this is the very first mine that was founded up here in Purple Creek and Baker. It was founded by a rancher whose name was Robert Womack, who liked to prospect in his free time. The problem with Robert Womack was he was an alcoholic. So as he was prospecting, he was always too inebriated to tell the difference between fool's gold and real gold. <laughs> so for 12 years, Robert Womack sent mostly fool's gold to the Assayer's office and eventually earned the nickname Crazy Bob. No one knows exactly what happened, but one day he sent in enough real gold for them to say, yes, this area is worth mining. He established a gold king mine, and Robert Womack became famous for the gold rush of Cooper Creek. Not long after that, he wanted to celebrate his newfound fame, so he went on a drinking spree in what's now known as Old Colorado City, where while he was on that spree, he sold his claim for $500. <laughs> oh, yeah. But right next to that display is a Molly Kathleen gold mine. If you take a look at the picture right above it, you can see us in the middle. Right down the hill to the left was a Gold King mine, so we were very close together. But Molly Kathleen and her family moved here from Ottumwa, Iowa, when the gold rush of the started. Her son and her husband quickly got jobs working for the mining industry. Her son became a surveyor, but her husband became a mine claim lawyer. One day, Molly Kathleen was walking around the town of Cripple Creek and noticed a herd of elk on the outskirts of town. She had never seen these animals before, so she wanted to take a closer look at them and start hacking the background. She looked down, she eventually got tired and sat down to catch her breath. When she sat down, she saw a big rock sticking on the ground that looked just like Exhibit A, and there's a small piece of that in the glass if you want to take a closer look as well. What you guys are hearing in the background is a recording of explosions going off once again. And the reason why we're able to hear that throughout the entire tour is because that speaker is hidden in the Julian Davis drift right behind us. <laughs> now, 
Molly Kathleen thought that rock looked cool, so she broke off a couple pieces, took them home, and showed them to her husband. Her husband took them to an assayer, and it turns out that she had found high-grade ore, or a lot of gold bubbles in her samples. If you want to see what that gold looks like after it's been heated up to 1,400 degrees, it was bubbling up out of those rocks. Right behind you, sir, Exhibit G is a piece of rope. You can have a woman trying to step in a mind come operation. <laughs> and they took this superstition so seriously that was the main reason they gave for refusing her the rights to this mine. She took it up with her husband. Did you see? Oh, yes. Yes. It's simple. <laughs> Fool's gold. <laughs> now, so Molly Kathleen, because of that superstition, was refused the rights to this mine. So she took it up with her husband, he fought for rights mine, and they did eventually win, making her one of the very first women in history to own her mine claim. Even though she had won that right to mine, nobody wanted to work for her because it was supposed to be bad luck. Well, the miners that couldn't meet the quotas and the rest of the mines around us were running out of options, and they got desperate enough to give Molly Kathleen's mine a try. Out of nearly 500 mine, oh, that was yours to keep if you want. <laughs> out of nearly 500 mining companies in this 24 square mile radius around us, not only was she one of the most profitable, she's one of the very few mines that continually produce gold from the time that she opened to the time that she closed. So for 70 years, hardly a day went by, they did not pull gold out of the time. I am giving you guys each a souvenir that does contain a lion CD. And it's just a small mine shaft when we came down. But as we walk down here, some of the taller people will have to watch their head and stick to the mine. When you take a look down that mine shaft, hold on to your hard hats, glasses, cameras, phones, anything you do not want to lose in the mine shaft. If you want to take a look down that mine shaft, you press the Now, I'm willing to bet that at least one of you guys was not a fan of the nine man miners' cage, the mine shaft that we used to get down here. <laughs> but before we had those cages, when miners came down here to work, they're going to put all their supplies in that sinking bucket. The miners would then stand on a lift of that bucket, hold on to that cable, and they have to balance themselves out as they get lower down into the mine. This is, of course, before we had any form of MSHA, the Miner Safety Health Association. So we're not allowed to do this anymore. <laughs> but they'd also fill those buckets full of rocks. Bring it back up to the surface, and using this plane right here called an apron, you can dump that bucket in the ore cart on the other side, send it right back down the mine shaft. Once you've had a chance to take a look down this wind, if I can have you stand on that side of the grate, I would really appreciate it. Now, what we're about to be operating is an antique steam hoist that has been converted to compressed air if you want to take a picture or video. Most of the noise will be over here. If you want to cover your ears, you're welcome to do that as well. donkeys that have free roam across the town. They are protected by the National Historic Society. They are one of America's only mobile landmarks, and they have more rights than the citizens of Cripple Creek themselves. <laughs> Every year in the summer, they celebrate a holiday up here called Donkey Derby Days, where they spend an entire weekend racing random donkeys around town. I'm from Iowa. I don't understand this holiday, so I just avoid it altogether. <laughs> but the reason why they protect those donkeys so well nowadays is because the ones that are allowed free roam across the town are the last remaining descendants of the donkeys that we used in the mines beforehand. We'll talk about how their ancestors were treated and what used to be their stables next. There are about 14 donkeys left to roam around the town. Those are also good places to take a look. We've actually walked through most of this level. It's about three quarters of a mile down here. Um, 
but the upper level is really good if you want to check out. Unfortunately, we can't take you up there. <laughs> <laughs> Was that? Did they have like a sewer down here or anything? For the donkeys and the donkeys? Um, no, it was just the miners and the kids that were taking care of those donkeys. Now this used to be the donkey stables. And when we had donkeys down here, they could be born down here. They could live down here and most of the time die down here in complete darkness. But eventually Theodore Roosevelt became president. And when he became president, wanted to know what was going on in the mines across the country. When he saw the way these donkeys were being treated, he passed a legislative law that required us to take every donkey back up to the yeah. surface for a minimum of an hour a day. While that sounds like a good idea, could you imagine putting a full-size donkey in one of those cages that we brought down? <laughs> this is going to be pretty difficult. So they would put that donkey into a sling and tie that up to the bottom of those cages, and they'll hoist them right up to the surface. <laughs> there were quite a few problems with this, but the biggest problem is if those donkeys survive, they've never seen sunlight their entire lives. First man said sunlight could actually blind the animal completely. Now it took them a while, but they finally realized it was best to get rid of those donkeys altogether. So one night they took the donkeys back up to the surface to kind of free. And the donkeys that still had their vision were able to guide the blind donkeys around town. And that's how we ended up with donkeys that still roam the town today. When they got rid of the donkeys, though, they turned their stables into the miners' diner, or as some people like to call this one of the original hard rock cafes. <laughs> but that way you can light your fuse. Come over here and eat your lunch, the shots went off. And when your shots were done going off, they would flip a switch over here that powers a fan on the other side of this wall. That fan will take air from the mine shaft. Point it down these chutes, down those tunnels, so you wouldn't have to worry so much about the silicosis being in the air after the bus. When we come to this next area, we'll take a look to your right first. All right, now back in the old days, each mine had their own belt code system. So if you're a miner who couldn't meet your quota, the next mine you go to could have a completely different set of belts. When they were still using that sinking bucket back there, a group of miners caught a ride back up to the surface, but they gave their own belt code. And that hoist operator took it up to the surface and threw that bucket in a dump position, where the miners were thrown out and a ton of ore came down on top of those miners. None of them survived, but one of them had a brother whose name was J.W. Stonehouse, who owned and operated his own sign shop in Denver. When he heard about his brother's accident, he created this universal bell code system. And it took him a couple months, but he convinced a few of the mines in the area to just give this system a try. When they agreed it worked so well, this became the federal bell code that we use in all the gold mines around the United States today. Since those cages aren't waiting for us down here, I'm going to use this call bell. Let them know that we're waiting for a pickup at 1,000 feet using a 2-5 combination. So if they get our signal, they'll pick up a phone on the surface. And using that intercom on the other side, they can tell us just how long that wait's going to be. Hmm. All right. Now, when we came down here, you might have seen me use a bell on the other side of that shaft, and that's a command bell. It tells your voice operator what to do with the cages. When we came down here, we rang 2-5 to let them know we're going down 1,000 feet. We then added 3 for people low and run slow, and 2 for lower. So to come down here, it's 2-5, 3-2. After those cages are loaded up to go back up to the surface, we won't use this part of the chart. We'll ring three for people on and one for hoist. And that tells the hoist operator that we don't want to go to another part of the mine, but we want to be taken right back up to the surface. Behind you guys, underneath that sign is a miner's rescue basket. So if a miner was injured or killed down here, they'll strap you in that basket, just like the donkeys, you can tie it to the bottom of those cages and they just hoist you right back up to the surface. Now, if you guys want to take a picture beneath that sign while we're waiting for these cages, you are more than welcome to do so. But while you take those pictures, I'll talk about one last thing. If for some reason these cages yeah. broke down, we do have a couple backup plans. One of those backup plans is sitting in the hoist house. You might have a chance to see it. It's a Chrysler uh, 1953 331. that we've seen anyone take is about an hour and a half. And I am not a fan of this idea. So every year I smuggle that and I hide food and drinks along the tour. So if this cage is broke down for any reason at all, I have plenty. We would be prepared for a couple hours wait. But fortunately, this has never happened to me before. Yeah. <laughs> right. awesome. So does anybody have any questions while we're waiting for these cages?
but then also a knock to hinge over here so this side of the board will just swing open. That way all they have to do is pick it up and then shake it out.
It's a steam it's tractor. A tractor. Steam tractor. I've seen them operate. I've seen them drive down the road. Yeah. They have a festival in Pennsylvania. Thank you.